Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I'm Jody Grinwald. This week, my guest is Sean Keegan. Sean is the director and founder of Sisterhood SA, located in South Africa. There is a global problem that is not talked about enough called period poverty. Girls and women must have the right sanitary products to use monthly, yet what happens when they cannot afford them? Sean created a kit with all the necessary products that those who get their periods will need. She distributes them in areas dealing with extreme poverty. She also created an education program to help girls and boys learn about the changes that happen through puberty and the diseases that can be transmittable. Much of the work she is doing is happening in South Africa, yet in this episode she shares her desire to help so many others have what they need around the world. We also get a little bit of a lesson about South Africa. Please subscribe to the Today's the Day Changemakers YouTube channel. Download the podcast from most streaming sites. Don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Today is the Day Live It. Also, to learn more about Today is the Day's overall programming, international annual forum, the upcoming Changemakers Connective, business coaching and consulting, go to todayistheday.liveit.com. The views expressed by all Today's the Day Changemakers podcast guests are their own. Their appearance on the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast does not imply any endorsement of them or any entity that they represent. Thank you and have a fabulous week, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grunwald, and as I say every single week, I get to interview the changemakers, the inspirers, those who are doing incredible work around the world. And today I have Sean Keegan with me. Hi, Sean. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to have you, and I want everybody to know that it is because of this wonderful thing called Zoom that we can talk to people from all the way in South Africa, so I just love that we're getting to chat because of technology. Agreed. (laughs) So, uh, Sean, I'm just going to do a quick bio, and we're going to get right into a conversation because I just love what you're doing, and I think it's so important for people to hear about it. And I also want to make mention that we were in, we were introduced by um, another podcast guest, Heather Mistretta. So special shout out to Heather for, for this introduction. So Sean is the director and founder of Sisterhood SA, again, from South Africa. So she started her journey in 2019 with this organization, having to teach more men with the purse springs about periods than women should ever have to. Here we are trying to find the right fit of people funding in SA being the biggest challenge, along with having a completely new idea, never tried and tested, and having to have more self-belief than market had, for Sean, for it has been a real journey of ups and downs, and we're going to talk about it, a miraculous kit that she has put together to help women who are dealing with their periods and those who are just unable to afford the resources they need and to also gain the education that they need around this topic around the world, but she's starting in, in South Africa. So, Sean, thank you so much for being here. We're so I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. You know, I, I'm just reading something that you had uh, in your writing is that the UK that in the UK over 70% of young girls do not understand what is happening to their bodies when they start their period. That is just unbelievable to read on paper, and that statistic really kind of blew me away. Even when we had our first conversation, truly incredible, yes. isn't it? It, it is, and uh, the information that Heather sent through me, only 47% of schools in America actually do anything any kind of teaching regarding the reproductive um, process or any form of victimization which to me was a real challenge to try and understand because we have a subject that is done from a grade what is it I think it's grade six through to matric call which is when you're 18 called life orientation And life orientation actually discusses victimization in all its forms, bullying, sexual assault, et cetera. 
but in at an age appropriate level in South Africa. So they get this repetitiveness, but it, it increases in information as they get older. So it was very strange for me. So we are actually working with Heather and them now to look at what, where we can fill the gaps in the states in terms of the curriculums so that we can adjust accordingly and start to put the information out there. Because the biggest challenge is we can't put the lid on the fact that young girls are starting as young as 10 now. That means, that means we have to take responsibility for arming them with the information they need to have. Because sexual activity in some form or another starts at the age of 11 in the UK. Wow, wow. Before we get into all of this, and I really want us to get deep into this conversation, I want people to learn more about you. And you, I want to learn you. more about you. So um, <laughs> where where were you? You were brought up in South Africa. Just give us a little background and where in South Africa and, and just a little bit about you as a child. Okay, so I, I'm originally from the East Coast, uh, a city called Durban. It's regarded as the last British outpost. I uh, don't know if people realize, but South Africa was a British colony up until 19, 1961. So um, my family's been here since 1820 on my mom's side. I'm a McCullum. My mom is a McCullum. So I'm Scottish Irish descent, but I'm very much an African. Um, and I, I lived in Durban until I was eight, and then we moved inland to um, a rural area called Umsumkulu. And from there, we lived in Pretoria, the uh, legislative capital in South Africa. We only lived there for 18 months. And then we moved to what was known as Port Elizabeth, which is now um, on the east coast, uh, further down the coast. So I'm very much a, a eastern, uh, very much a sea loving and the beach lifestyle. That's kind of my thing. But I've also, when I, I joined the bank when I first left school, but I've also lived abroad quite extensively. I lived in Rome in Italy. I worked as a nanny back in the, back in the 90s when it was difficult for white South Africans to travel. I lived there for eight months. Then I went to the UK and we rejoined the Commonwealth uh, in 94. And I got a work permit, so I actually worked for Ryder PLC head office in London. So I worked for an American company, yeah. And uh, I've spent most of my life here, but I, I spent three years in Europe backpacking on my own. So that was 20, 28, 27 countries down in Europe. Um, and then I also was a business consultant in IT. I don't know if you call it SAP or SAP. It, it's a, it's a, 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 you call it SAP. Okay. Yes. I was an SAP consultant. So I did, did a lot of work for General Motors in Dubai mm -hmm. and in Barcelona and South Africa for a lot of the American, well, the American entity. Um, so I'm, I traveled firstly as a backpacker, which I much preferred. And then as a businesswoman, the businesswoman <laughs> thing didn't work for me. The staying in the hotels after you've been a backpacker and being in hostels and you meet the locals and people are more receptive, you know? So, yeah, so predominantly I've lived here, but I have traveled extensively, extensively and lived in many places. I speak Italian, I speak English, I speak uh, Dutch, well, Afrikaans, which is old Dutch. Uh, Afrikaans is kind of a mixture of Flemish, Dutch, and German, and there are a couple of little French words in there. Um, in South Africa, we all have to finish school with two languages. So we have to have two languages. And then I speak Isi Tosa, and I can sing in Isi Zulu quite effectively and efficiently. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I took a little French. I'm really not going to, I am not going to fare well in this conversation when it comes to languages. <laughs> A few words in Greek, a few words of, you know, but I, I can, you know, at the most important word for me is where is the bathroom, right? So that's like, <laughs> so, well, those are the words we need to know when we're in, a, in, 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 um, but that's that, that, no, incredible. Now, what we, uh, what you had in your bio here is that in 2019 is when Sisterhood SA was born. And so, um, what made you decide to go from banking and SAP and all of that to this? 
Um, well, I worked in logistics for a very long time and a lot of our logistics companies in South Africa, every single company in South Africa has to give one to 1 1.5 of their net profit every year to an NPO or an NGO, et cetera. So that you will always find within a business entity, those people that in, get involved in NGO work on behalf of their companies, because when they do their submissions to the tax man, in order for these companies to get the rebate, by in, uh, putting money into these NGOs, these auditing processes and everything that have to be followed. So there's always entities within um, UTR or DHL or which, whichever the company may be that, that have people that are dedicated to working with these NGOs. And what I found was that this was the number one issue preventing the equality of young girls in school. In South Africa, 70, girls miss on average 75 to 100 days of school. And that's the same for varsity students and the same for um, uh, women who just cannot afford, you know, in your lower income bracket. And the studies that came out of Stanley University in 2019 was putting it at, at 30%. And now since COVID with, like our province alone, us, the state that we live in, we've got a 53% unemployment now since COVID. So it's, it's imperative that we needed to find an African solution. And a lot of the solutions weren't working. And then when you go to the rural areas, you are uh, asked, then it's not necessarily running water at the schools. Let me just Sorry. back up one second because yeah. I want to make sure that our listeners understand what we're talking about here um, for those who are not familiar about the organization. We're talking about the fact that there are not a lot of resources for women in, in Africa that are, you know, during uh, a woman's menstruation. Is that correct? That, that's that's it, it, It's the expense of the goods. It's the cost of the goods because it costs 100 rand a um for a month for them to take care of themselves. It's the expense and the access accessibility in rural areas that are problematic. But let's be clear that period poverty is an international issue. It's not an African issue. It's an international issue that has not received the attention globally that it deserves. Only two countries have resolved this during COVID. One is Scotland, where they have dispensing machines, where they started doing this, uh, uh, having free dispensing machines in the shopping in the shops um, that were that are funded by government. That they started Scotland started that in 2020, and New Zealand started that in February of uh, 2021. But New Zealand only has a population of five million people, <laughs> right. so. Okay, fair enough. So you're looking at maybe 2.7 that are women and you're looking at maybe 1 million where you're looking at our country where we have 56 million people and the majority of those people live in, in the poverty line, under the poverty line. And that's the same for the whole of Africa. But it, the saddest thing is when you, when you look at it, the harm that the disposables are also doing to the environment, they're the number one harm is to the environment worldwide as well because they take... 400 to 1,000 years, if you look at disposable sanitary towels and disposable nappies, they're the biggest harm is to the environment worldwide. So not only do we not have, but when we are using, we are using these things that are affecting our water systems and the climate because of the decomposing of the product. So the NGO process that has been created globally to try and fix this problem has not worked. And the reason it hasn't worked, and it's worse now because you are looking at over, uh, you are looking now at a global issue in terms of food security. That's the number one issue now globally coming, going into a recession. Food is the biggest issue. So those NGOs that would normally get some funding, remember that a lot of factories and manufacturers have only just started working again coming out of COVID. So that net profit that they, that 1% or 1.5% of net profit isn't there because they were shut down due to COVID. So you've got this ripple effect that has happened globally. So when the NGOs knew that every three months they were getting money, they haven't got money. 
And I started looking, and that's why we are repetitive manufacturing. And I'm looking, I'm, I'm talking to two big retailers currently in South Africa, the most common and driven largely by very um, effective and efficient women, you know, uh, that sit in very senior positions to get it into the retail market because the pro our product has a two-year life cycle. So you're looking at something that's far cheaper, it's durable and it's less harmful to the environment. And then we put the educational aspect into it by talking about the top 19 diseases. We talk about period poverty and we talk about contraception. And then if you look at the website, we talk about, um, obviously talk about um, puberty and what happens to your body and how your body changes and the impact of that and what's normal and what's normal, what's not normal. Because when we go to our GPs, our GPs by and large are men. Okay, we, we haven't got that equality right yet. I remember getting frustrated. I've got stage four endometriosis and one in nine women have endometriosis globally. It's as common as diabetes, but it takes eight to 10 years to diagnose. And if you like me, it becomes debilitating. And I have a hypersensitivity to medication. So in terms of pain meds and things like that, I take three Panado, which is what do you call it? Paracetamol, and it makes me drowsy. So I have to be very careful about what I take. And the only thing that worked for me was eventually the loop. And I was in my 30s when I had the loop put in. And then when you go to have a replacement every five years, so the gynae said, he says, no, you don't need an in injection or anything, but they remove the thing and I pass out from the pain. Right. So, <laughs> you know, right. it's this, this indifference. And it took 45 minutes for them to get me to stabilize. And I still had to call my sister to get my niece to come and drive me home because I couldn't drive home. It's that ignorance, that profound ignorance and lack of understanding. And I think you've seen it now. That shift in America, I, I watched in one of the uh, southern states where a guy apologized, one of the Senate, uh, one of the guys in local go government apologized for signing off on a bill in, I can't remember which state it was, because he had, a, now had been told by a doctor about a 19-year-old girl that had an optopic pregnancy. And because there was still a fetal heartbeat, the doctors couldn't do anything legally. And she had, she was going to pass that baby and bleed and likely lose her uterus as a result of complete and utter biology ignorance, you know? Yes. So a lot of that we, going we, on right now. Yeah. So we need to take the conversation to the guys and the girls. And the objective of our organization is not just to offer product, but to offer education. So when we do these direct deliveries to the schools, we mm -hmm. teach the boys and the girls. So we, firstly, we're removing the stigma of this that's been around since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always, I always have this joke that my, my poor little brother, we four girls, one boy, I'm the oldest of five, good Irish Catholics. And, and uh, my brother's one of a twin, he's got a twin sister. And when he was in, in grade 10, he had to do an Afrikaans oral and he did it on PMS. And he stood there and he said, I'm an expert, I've got four sisters. But <laughs> he's lucky, you know, he, he's so lucky. He's gone on these journeys with us. Everything is like spoken about so easily and so freely. Um, and when we, there's a naivety when you grow up like that. My father is also a registered nurse by profession, um, specialized in psychiatry, but he's a registered nurse. So we grew up with all this, the freeing conversation. And it's, it's debilitating when you engage with people that aren't empowered with the information they need to have. And that's our objective. Our objective is not just to offer something completely different in a product. It's not just about us offering different sizes in pads to accommodate the 10 year old little girls who are currently crutch sizes are not being accommodated. Um, and to, to create the viability of information that ensuring that, that we provide them with alternative products like salt and bicarb to use to clean with that are far less harmful to the environment. But also because one in three girls 
have a hypersensitivity to soap. And, and salt is an antibacterial. So you see salt, it's cheap, it's easy to replenish, and as I say, far less harmful to the environment. And the combination of bicarb and sea salt is an old tradition here in South Africa. Salt is used very wide, widely, even for cleansing of the skin and stuff like that um, uh, uh, by black people in South Africa. So it's, it's very medicinal and it's seen as medicinal. So it's not in hard cell, you know, but we need no, to... Mm, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just want to go back to the... So you're talking about the kit. So I just want to, people to yes, know might not be... Yes. Right. I, so I just want to go back. So share with us this kit that you are bringing out into the community, uh, what is involved in it? So let's just kind of go okay. back to that for a minute. Okay, so this is the kit. The kit consists of a waterproof wings base, uh, which is your wing. And then it has two tiling, uh, three, three tiling pad, pads, two for heavy flow, one for light flow. It, the tiling um, also has waterproofing on the inside to offer the girls more protection. Then we offer, um, then we also offer a, a sachet for, for soil pads. All our packaging is biodegradable. If, if you take a look at the bottom here, we talk to small, medium and large and it's color coded and that is specifically, and everything is picture based. That's for those who cannot read and write. Or if you're going into an area where language is an issue, it doesn't matter. That's why we've done it the way that we've done it. Um, I just want to, and then we also give panties. The reason why most projects in Africa have failed is because there's an assumption that girls have panties. And that's not necessarily the case. It's actually a novelty to, to have panties. And the crutch of the panties, it's made out of cotton. It's a middle of the range cotton. And it's actually got a waterproofing in it, in the crutch, to give the girl an extra bit of protection for school. And then the 200 gram of bicarb and the 200 gram of sea salt to teach them that they don't need expensive product to clean with. And then if you look on the inside, we talk to the top, that's better. We talk to the top 19 diseases in layman's terms. We don't use high affiliated English We've actually sat with doctors and they translated it into easy English for us. And then we talked to period poverty and we also talked to um, contraception, the different types of contraception. So it's literally an introduction for girls to understand that what could be going wrong. Uh, and a good example of this is that cervical cancer is a South African disease. It's a very prominent disease and it's carried by the male. So what we've had to do and then transmitted, uh, it's triggered in puberty. So what, what, what we've had to do here is first, initially we started in uh, the girls were getting an injection, like a vaccine, okay, to protect them. The HPV, and then, are you talking about HPV virus? HPV, yeah, HPV, yeah. And now they're rolling it out in the schools for the young boys from the age of 11 to 13. The idea is to get in before they hit puberty because it's triggered by puberty. Mm -hmm. So wh what we are wanting to do when we start exporting into other countries, we want to work with leading universities. We want to work with the health departments. We want to work with the educational departments because there are going to be areas where it's specific to region. And we need to address that and actually afford them and give them the information and equip them with what they need to have. Um, when I just spoke about, um, I spoke about cervical cancer, I spoke about my endometriosis, one of the most common other factors, and my niece had it at 15, is ovarian cancer. It's become very, very prominent in young teenage girls. And Taylor lost an ovary at 15. We found, and she was just sleeping a lot. And she had a bit of a protrusion in her belly all of a sudden over a two week period. And my sister happens to also be a registered nurse. And she had flu and Sheridan asked the doctor to please look at it because it doesn't look right to her. And mm -hmm. Taylor went in, to her, that was a Friday afternoon. By half past nine that night, we knew she, were, she had cancer. And by the Monday, they had to remove it. 
the mass was the size of a 27 week old fetus. And yeah, so it is incredibly important for us now that we've got all of this information, we've got little girls starting as young as 10, we've got this massive ignorance around <laughs> menstrual cycle, around reproductive organs, around, and it's impossible for me to understand why legislation has been passed when people don't know enough. They, they haven't actually consulted with experts to get an understanding of how much can go wrong. You know, uh, there was there was just an article today in our, one of our newspapers in the farming areas where they are now looking at incorporating um, birthing classes for young girls at school because there's so many young girls that are pregnant at school. We had over 300 young girls between the ages of 10 and 14 in our province, in our state, that fell pregnant last year, just in our province. And, and, and it's not because we're African. It's happening globally. It's happening globally because we are not empowering our little girls. Moms, what's happened globally when I did my research and what I found was, is that, um, Moms don't know what the conversation with the 10 year old needs to look like. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because it's, because it's a different conversation between a 10 year old and a 14 year old. So moms are clueless. So, so they avoid the subject because they don't know what it needs to look. They reliant on the school. And then I get information from Heather telling me that only 47% of the schools in America cater to this. Discussion. It is. It's interesting, like in our family, very open about these types of things, but yeah. not every family is the, is the exact same way. Pam 10 is a leader in IT enterprise solutions and staffing. They are driven to transform their clients' business performances. They do this every day by providing the clients with the best services and products. Products like BizLego, an online community platform, and Colear, a unique learning management system. They also transform the lives of women and children through their associated nonprofits, SheTech, which supports women in and joining the technology field, and Softkin, support organization for kids in need. PAM10, technology for social good. Go to pam10.com for more information. You and I talked about something um, when we were getting ready for this podcast, which was to describe the difference between a developing country and a third world country. And I want to stop there because I know that you you even just said a moment ago, it's not just in Africa or South Africa. Yeah. Like, you know, it is important for those who don't live where you are to understand the difference between a third world country and a developing country. So let's stop there for a minute and just have you explain what that difference is. Okay, there actually is no difference. They've just changed, changed the terminology from third world. That's the old uh, technical term being used. But the connotation of being third world mm -hmm. is that you are underdeveloped. And right. South Africa bought you heart transplants. <laughs> Dr. Chris Barnard grew up on a farm three and a half hours from where I live. And he was the first, he was the leading pioneer in heart transplants. Um, we bought you Pain TV. Pain TV in America was designed by a South African conglomerate out of Stellenbosch University, a guy by the name of Chris Becker. We brought you um, the most advanced technology in terms of banking. So, and I understand it because I've lived in Europe. I mean, I got a lot of questions. Why, uh, uh, why am I, what, are my parents black? Why do I speak English? Not understanding that we were a British colony. So I, I would encourage, there's a, there's a show called The Real South Africa on YouTube that is about a guy by the name of Mark Blanton that worked for the Secret Service and came to South Africa in 2010 uh, with, as part of Biden security in 2010. And him and his wife now live here. And they, are, they have the biggest rush of Americans, Black Americans moving to South Africa. Uh, you know, and, and they are astonished, the schooling systems and, and the educational and the level. So the connotation was removed and that's why they refer to it as developing. But that, that, the reason why it's called that 
is because of the amount of people that live below the poverty line. That's how the calculation is done. So it's got nothing to do with your technical advancement. It's got nothing to do with whether you have proper housing, you have heating, you have banks, you have proper roads and stuff like that. It's actually the amount of people that live below your poverty line. Um, we are known as the, um, South Africa is kind of known as the cosmopolitan of Africa. It's kind of where everything happens. It's just, you know, the, from an advancement point of view, but that takes nothing away from Nigeria. It takes nothing away from, and I've worked and lived there. Um, Kenya, Ghana, all those countries. And, and you guys might find it strange, but most of those governments have, have had half females in their governments for 20, 30 years already, the representation of women in government has far exceeded what you are catching up with now. We get paid leave, we get maternity leave, we get, so it, it, it's to change the perception of that connotation of third world. That's, it's, it's become developing country. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And and my whole thing is, is to really educate those who may not, it's just, they don't know. No, they don't know. You know we don't know we don't know and i think it's important that we 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 all learn the one, the other yeah. thing i want to ask you is is when it when it comes to the kit i think most people will be like especially those who use disposable products all the time maybe thinking like well you know is that kind of you know uh, gross or or you know to have to re to have to wash the product but they have to understand that you can't it costs so much money to consistently have new disposable product for those who can't afford so you have to have something exactly and and i'm just going to show you quickly so this is the medium size so this is what it, the pad looks like and it's made of dark toweling material so it's a servable color and it's also inconspicuous so when the girls need to hang it on the line they don't need to get embarrassed we also know as women that they do this when they wet in the center so we've got the velcro that gets accommodated. This is color coded with the different sizing, obviously, as I say, for those who cannot read and write. So this effectively is made out of raincoat material. Okay, so it's really very soft. And the toweling, you all know toweling because you use towels on a daily basis. So you can pop it in the washing machine or you can wash it. Um, I would suggest before you put it in the washing machine, you just soak it in the bicarb and the salt, soak it for a bit and then put it in the washing machine. It takes about two hours to dry because it's got the waterproofing on the inside as well. Honestly, it's more comfortable than what we, okay, I'm past my sell by date. I don't have this problem anymore, but <laughs> that was very well gone enough. And I am sorry, I am sorry. So, so uh, yeah, it was a blessing in disguise. But um, for a lot of girls, I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time, and if you go onto the website and take a look with the young girls, talking to them about it, they're using cloth anyway, but they're using cloth that causes infections because it, it, it's not absorbent. They don't realize that they can't just use any cloth. So they end up with thrush and they end up with yeast infections and all those kinds of things. And, you know, you, you've got Planned Parenthood and we've got a government facility that's like Planned Parenthood. But the queues, because you must remember our poverty line again, you know, the proportion of people that have to use those services. So people can be standing outside there all day and still not get seen. So it's imperative that I want to start mobile clinics where we can hand out thrush cream and things like that eventually one day where girls can just come along once a week, we go to the schools or once a month we go to the schools and we actually say, okay, and we have a nursing sister with us. She does a check on the girls. They say, I've got the skin irritation or whatever the case may be. So they don't have to go to the clinics anyway. You know, and, and the same thing for contraception, because this whole thing in the States, too, about they want to remove contraception. Contraception, I would be debilitated on a monthly basis if I had not had the lupin because of the migraines that I get because when I have my cycle, the anemia, the severe anemia because of the heavy bleeding. All of those things have an impact on your health. And those things are controlled by hormone tablets because it's a hormone condition. 
right. So you, so you can't take away something that fixes something. You know, girls that are regular, one of the, the many things that I come across with the girls is obviously the skin irritations and that that's one on the forefront because it's one in three. But the other thing is girls that are having their periods every two weeks, they don't realize that it's not normal and they end up with anemia and it just becomes a vicious cycle. And then they battle at school because they're always tired, et cetera. And this an inability to have access or not being able to afford is the second biggest problem in Africa. Right. The second biggest problem affecting women in Africa. And the if you fix 10% of the problem, you increase your GDP by 3%. Wow. <laughs> and yet it doesn't get the attention that it that it should be getting. And yet it's it's it, and it's a, again, it's a global issue. It's not just us, it's everybody. What nobody has done, which we are doing, obviously, with the sizing, with the rewashable, there are products on the market, but I, my two drivers were twofold. One, accessibility, that's why we want direct delivery to the schools with an education program. You don't get a delivery without, a, without an educational program that is facilitated with a person, with a curriculum that is done with the boys and the girls. No, and you do it separately and you do it separately they don't have to be together to do it because it's when i don't know how old the kids are when the first introduction of sex is in your schools but it's 10 here i think around the same if i remember correctly with my kids it was around fifth grade yeah yeah so it, and i mean they always i remember my nephew jed coming home and he says shani i'm gonna adopt my children i'm not <laughs> oh, yeah, they, all, they all say that they all they all yeah, say that at 10. Yeah. And yeah, then he's 18 now. Yeah, he's yeah, 18 now. And I said to him, when he was 10 years, a piece of paper, write it down for me and sign it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Remember that. Throughout the time that you're, you know, 13 to 19. But I just want to stop for a minute and, and let everybody know it's sisterhood, S-A-P-T-Y dot C-O dot Z-A. Is that correct? 100 period yeah all right i just want and we'll have that up on the youtube channel but again for those listening via the podcast it's sisterhood s-a-p-t-y dot c-o dot z-a and so you can find all of that information there so let me ask you this people who are listening they they're they're passionate about what you're talking about they feel like wait a minute you know what this conversation is not being had and we need to have it how can they help Okay, uh, well, th they can pop me an email. Uh, my email address is on the website. Um, it's Sean, it's S H A A N K at sisterhood, S A P T Y dot C O dot Z A. But it's on the website. They can pop me an email. The biggest thing for us is obviously funding to support the schools. That's why we've partnered with an NGO that has a direct link to the Department of Education. They work with the Re Department of Education and uh, to help us facilitate which schools are the most needy in what areas and getting out to the rural areas sooner rather than later. Um, and with the CSR program from businesses, I can link corporates to, to schools. And because our product has a two-year life cycle, we can do one school one year with the top up uh, the, the next year and then do it with another school the next year. So there's a lot of practicalities, but the biggest thing for us is obviously funding to facilitate this. But I would ask you all, look at your own communities first. My objective is for everybody to look after their own first, not because I feel that anybody is more needy, but I know what the projects look like in America. I understand the poverty in the Native American populations. I've spoken to Heather. It's exactly the same that we have here. Take care of your own. The rest will come. Find people that are doing community work in certain communities already, NGOs, Ask them what they are doing to facilitate this problem. Get an introduction done so that we can start moving stock out of South Africa for landed cost into America. 
without the um, without the obviously we we need to calculate we'll need to calculate what the expense is to freight, but just the unit cost alone is eight just over eight dollars for two years. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, for the small and the medium, and then for the large, it's just over nine. It, it, right. it, they, I know because I've done my homework, there's nothing in your market currently that offers right. this facility with the education program. And I, I don't want to keep this information to myself. We want to have an international training um, training center. So we will have Zoom yes. calls where we, would, where we do train the trainer courses. So there's a teacher at the school or a counselor at the school or somebody in the community, in the Native American community, that is actually facilitating and equipping people with information. And when a new person comes along, we do the same and we educate them because withholding this information serves their purpose. So let's just share it and take yeah. this information back to the universities and the health departments and everything That's so that we can start way. getting them in line. And we can then do a presentation to your guys in the Senate and explain to them what biology is. Is that that sharp? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so glad we, we've met and, and, and you brought this to, to a, you know, something that I, I personally haven't done a lot of thinking about until we met, which made me think, how come I haven't had, you know, as a female, as a woman, why haven't I really thought about this um, yeah. that much? And so that's why it was important for me to bring you on because I don't know that many of us think about it. You know, we know that there's these disposable products and we think everybody has them, but that is not true. Just like food, it, for those who can't afford food, they also can't afford diapers and sanitary products and all of those other things and contraceptives and all of that. Exactly. And we need to pay attention as, as humans, doesn't matter yeah. what background or where you live. As humans, male or female, it, it doesn't matter. We this is Correct. this is this is biology. This is the, there's yeah. nothing we can do about it. It's biology. Yeah. It's not it's not about being ashamed. It's not about being shy. It's no. about thinking a real issue because people cannot leave their homes bleeding. We need to figure exactly. it out. Exactly. And I, and I, I, you hit the nail on the head by saying it's just biology. It's been it's been sold. I mean, we we have a cultural uh, issue in in so it's not an issue. It's just a tradition in South Africa where most children live with their grandparents in the black communities until their school going age, and then they revert to their parents that are invariably living in the cities or in big towns, etc. And they start school, and then to to fix not to fix the re relationship, but to create a better bonding. There used to be like a a three uh, like a they would start they start school here between five and six so you you're five and six years old so you've got at least six years to get the relationship as it should be you know living with your mom now because the little girls are starting at 10 that time is not there anymore so we have got workshops that we do at various ngos and that where we take the moms aside and we have conversations with the moms and then with the dads but then again, now you have, it doesn't matter whether you're in Africa or in Europe, because you're talking about, um, look, gay marriage has been here since 97. Again, a very forward thinking. They are protected in their constitution since 94. Okay. It's in our constitution. So we are very forward thinking in, ter in terms of this, but we need to offer programs to those families that are two dads. You know, yes. Yes. we've got two dads or we've got a generation gap because what we find is when there's a grandparent, they never got the, they were never sat down to have the conversation. So they don't understand either. So whether you're in a developing country or in, an, in, in, in a developer, it doesn't matter. The problem is the same. It just looks slightly different in terms of the dynamics. So how do we, how do we facilitate that? so that we're having that conversation you know invariably you find that the gay dads are really good because they don't they go and get the information because they work harder at it i i could i definitely could see that without a doubt yeah, I, they I work, definitely... yeah they work harder at it but 
but we need to, you know, they will get this, this service level information to give them. We need to make sure that we arm our girls because they are so much more prone to disease now because of the garbage we're putting in our food. Uh, with all the hormone stuff that we're putting in the food, we have triggered this and that's why girls are starting so young now because of that. So we need to find a way to empower them. And we do that by educating them. So again, I'm going to say, I'm not looking for you to fund South African schools. I'm looking for you to go to your communities, wherever you are in the world, and the NGOs that are working in those communities, see what their needs are. And we can start exporting to you and running the train the trainer facilities because, because of our labor's cheaper here, you, you can't manufacture it at what we can send it to you at landed cost. You know? So I don't want to keep it to myself, but I do want to empower the girls out there so they don't grow up. Taylor was lucky she had a mom who was a nurse. My sister just, you know. Figured it out. And, yeah. yeah, and and we need we need to find a way to arm girls, and we need. I would love to be in one of those senate hearings. I would have such fun. <laughs> yeah. We need you there. We need you there. That'd be great. I advocate. I advocate for that. You know, uh -huh. you know, on my website, I talk about Africanacity. My great grandmother, my, my mom's. My great, great great grandmother died when I was 22, but she was the first female mayor in South Africa. And the family joke, the family joke is I've got her mouth. So <laughs> I'm quite happy to go up there and 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 say my and ask where's this ignorance come from? Because you gotta you've got to educate. If you if we if we need to go to Mrs. Biden and say this is your gap in life orientation. This is what you should be doing in life orientation. Here's the syllabus. Let's make it happen across schools in America. Let's do that. If that's what we need to do to facilitate, to keep our girls safe, then that's what we need to do. You know, we can't just say a girl of 10 years of age must carry a baby full term. Because that's a mess. You know, it is, it is a mess. It is a mess. And, and there's so much more to that topic that we'll, yeah. we'll have on. A, that's a whole other show. <laughs> show. I, I mean, totally could be five shows. And um, the other thing real quick before I ask you my last yeah. question is there's another M word, right? We go from menstruation to menopause. And yeah. so I would assume in the same vein that the girls are not being educated young, the women are not also being educated on what's happening in their body when their bodies start changing and going through menopause. Do you have yeah. anything, to say, anything to share yes. on that? Yeah, so we are going to go from, from puberty right the way through to menopause on our website. We will be facilitating that in language of choice as well. When we work at America, we want to do it. We have 11 official languages in South Africa. So we're going to be talking across our 11 official languages. Um, a lot of the black languages, like the Native American languages, are area specific geographically. Um, but we want to do that. But when we work in America, we want to do it in Spanish and in English. Uh, and, and the biggest thing that I also want to do, if there's anybody that's on here that does a lot of work at the prisons in America, I want to start talking to the prison systems because women have to pay for their own product in America. And that means that women that don't have and can't afford, it's a very different conversation to spend $8 or $9 over two years um, and you, you're in a facility where you can wash it, where you do have a basin, where you can dry it out, et cetera. Let's start helping those ladies that are sitting in prisons that actually need that help. Because to me, that's inhumane. Yeah, no, and that was, again, something that, um, you know, I haven't looked up, but you would share that with me. So I appreciate um, hearing that. I do. There's so yeah. many things that my guests <laughs> teach me yeah, and, and, and others who are listening. So I, I do. Yeah, that no, you're not a nerd. You're just smart, and you're and you do the work. And there's so much to look up. Google's got everything for you as long as you have the time to look for it, right? Um, yeah. But no, I appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, you know, Thank girls, you. They, they they need they need these supportive services around the world. You know, not like you said, wherever your feet are, there's there's yeah. some child somewhere that is in need. 
and some family yeah. that's in need. So they need the education. So Sean, what is the footprint? This is my last question for you. What is the footprint you're creating right now that you want to leave behind? Uh, for me to service my continent, my, there are 54 countries on my continent. Mm -hmm. um, it's to empower, it's to, to reach the, the girl in the remote village. But I think it's also to help it's also to bridge a gap between the fact that the way this is a universal issue that has not been addressed universe, universally, and it should have. Somebody at the UN or somewhere should have picked this up and said, what can we do to create a uniform program? Now, we've been endorsed by the United Nations, and we've been endorsed by Novartis Pharmaceuticals, who have a footprint into 47 countries in Africa. So we started that framework, but a little, a little girl, there's nothing little about me. There, there, there's a girl sitting all on her own in, in South Africa, at, at the tip of South Africa, trying to get this done from Zoom and from conversations with people. So I think for me, it's to create the footprint, bridge the divide, understand that girls universally are having this issue. We as Africans don't need to be embarrassed about the fact that it's just us, because it's not just us, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And where we find a uniform decision, but the most, th the biggest thing for me is about empowering young girls. That's my footprint. Let's give them, them the information they need to have in order to protect them. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, Sean. Thank you for sh for sharing that. And I want to have you back on as things get updated for you and mm. and and we keep spreading this. And again, I'm going to say this and I have to read it. It's sisterhood s a p t y dot c o dot z a really important take a look at the website learn a little bit more about sean and then all the product and things that that she's working on is up there to to be found and then we'll have where everybody else can find you on any social media as well in the show notes um anything anything else before we go that you want to share um i have been approached by the east coast institute in new york That's right they yeah, they want to work, they want to work with us as well. So if there's anybody that's on the podcast, they can think of ways that we can actually do create this network in the States um, to start facilitating some sort of program, because at some point I would have to come to the States and we can sit down and map out how we're going to do it and what we're going to do. And I, I know Heather's very keen for that as well. And um, I actually am on the... Uh, I sit on a committee for the Business Women's Forum in our city and our chairperson, she's working directly with our government at the moment for this project. So, so um, Leanne's busy working on that so that we can sort of create a, a, some sort of agreement with the, with the states and start working as a collective and come, work, come up with a program. But I'm sure if we got hold of Mrs. Biden, we could actually yes. expedite this thing. So one okay. of you, if you're sitting there and you know how to get to her, she's an educator, she understands. I think she's the perfect person to have to facilitate this. Listen, if we could get Mrs. Biden to be like our keynote speaker for our change makers forum, that'd be great too. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a dual, it could be a dual, uh, a dual piece, but I would, I would love I'd love to for for other people to help. And that's been the thing about change makers. I just want to add here too is that change makers continuously help each other. They lift each other up. It it's less ego and more about us together making a difference and and all of us together leaving our footprints and the good work that we want to leave behind because everything we do matters and makes a difference. So change makers is not just a podcast. It's a forum, it's a connective and it's about belonging and and changing the world for the better. So I'm happy to have you on this ride with us as well sean thank you very much and will you send me the link so i can post everything on our oh our i will i will but i'm going to just finish thank up you. with saying we've mentioned heather a couple times so i just want to give heather again yes. mistretta yes. she was with She's with Wage International, Women and Girls Education International, and you can find 
her podcast a couple of episodes ago. So please check that out. Sean Keegan, thank you so much for your time. And, and we're going to be putting this, this uh, podcast out there. And anybody who um, is listening, again, you can go back and listen to where you can find Sean. And I'm looking forward to sharing her story here and updates. And what I say at the end of every single podcast is this. Today is the day. You cannot go back to yesterday and you do not yet own tomorrow. So what small or large step are you going to take today to get yourself closer to your goals? Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Good night.